At the end of the day, we are apparently in the world's worst ever depression. That means there is less money than ever in countries. And actually, we now know where the money is. It's parked in these offshore havens. Atiyah Varis is university lecturer in international tax law. In the next 15 minutes, she talks about global tax evasion by multinational corporations. Welcome to Backlight Talks. I'll not name an island, but I'll, I'll, the idea is always an island, but it's not really an island. It could be a very ho heavily populated country that's very developed. And they set up these provisions that allow people to basically to hide money. So tax havens have, for one part, become this place where people can hide their money that they can get illegally and illegitimately. And Africa and many other developing countries are, are in this uh, point in time when there is so much corruption and so much money gets siphoned out of the country. And so every time we would get development aid, I remember people saying, but there's no effect on the ground. And, you know, the development aid would come in or a uh, government and a foreign government would give us a loan, but you'd not feel it in the country. And we could never understand why we didn't feel it. And now more and more, I think it's because when the money gets siphoned off by corruption, it doesn't mean that the corrupt leader is going to put it in his um, bank account in Nairobi or uh, uh, in Goma or Kinshasa. He's going to take it and put it somewhere where nobody's going to be able to find it. And these secrecy provisions actually allow a safe harbor for people doing these sort of things. And there's been a lot of discussion about the multinationals and how they utilize tax havens. And for them, it's about being able to hop and step from one country to another and minimize their tax burden. It's completely legal. It's, it's not illegal. But the question becomes, is, is this moral? Is this acceptable? Because an individual taxpayer is going to pay 35, 40% of their income for taxation. But this corporation, which is not a person, it's not a human being, so the profit is, in the, at the end of the day, the profit is going to an individual somewhere, the shareholders, the real owners of the companies. But this shareholder or this owner of the company that is much richer than that individual person working every day and paying 35, 40% tax, gets to pay 10% tax and sometimes doesn't pay any tax at all. And, and this is where there is a real problem with the system. There are loopholes in the system that are allowing people to continue to do this. And there, there, it is a parallel universe. And if you physically go there, there's nobody there. These are one person offices. There'll be one lady at reception filing papers. That's literally what the picture looks like. And this is across the world in these secrecy jurisdictions. Some of them are even PO boxes. So you literally send your mail there. The mail gets picked up and forwarded to the real address where the HR office is or whatever. So this is a major problem. It's These expenses are not checked and they cannot be checked because the there has to be an agreement between two countries to allow what we call exchange of information. Company agreements with the state are confidential, but the little bit that we do know is that they renegotiate company tax or corporation tax. So traditionally, corporation tax is about 25, 30%, maybe 35%, depending on which country you are in, of the total profits that a company makes. If it's 25, 30%, that is fair. That's about one quarter of the profit it makes. But what is happening in these private agreements is it goes down sometimes to 0% or 3% or 5%, which means that you ask the money to come, I mean, you ask the company to bring the money in. So the company brings the money in. It invests it, fine. It, it sets up, a, it rents an office space, it puts staff, the staff begin to work. 
then what happens? They extract whatever they need to extract, and then they leave and they take the FDI out with them. Yeah, so they take the capital. Out. Yes. So we have things like uh, special economic zones, um, and basically these are zones where you will go, you will build your factory, and then for ten years maybe the government will not uh, collect tax from you. These exist pretty much in every country in Africa right now as we speak. And what we've discovered in all the countries is that when that 10-year period ends, they simply they close up and they move. So it doesn't matter which country you look at, they, they stay for the period of the, the tax break and they leave afterwards. Tanzania had mining uh, problems with mining companies because they had 10-year tax holidays. So new mining legislation came into place two years ago. But the mining lobby was so strong that what happened was companies, mining companies that were already in the country still get the holidays, but new companies that come in from outside don't get the 10-year holiday. But what's happening in, in Tanzania now is that the companies already on the ground are just selling their assets to each other in like a circle, so they're still extending the 10-year tax holiday. I mean, this is, this is crazy. The whole point of a tax holiday is that you get a break for 10 years while you set up your business, you crystallize it, then you start to show profit. Then you're in the country and making profits and paying taxes. That was the point of giving you the 10-year startup. Not that you come in, invest, extract as much as you can and then leave the country. That's exploitation. There's, there's no other phrase for that in my mind. If this money is legitimately theirs and they haven't done anything wrong, then there's no problem. You can move your money. We live in a world that is globalized where money floats in different bank accounts all the time. But if you have dishonestly taken something away, then people have to stop thinking in terms of this is my money and I need to stay rich. You have to think in terms of I took away this money from the state and now there are no school books in the schooling system or there, is no there are no teachers or doctors in the schools and the hospitals to help people who are sick. I mean, the difficulty I think that comes about is the people that have usually used private services anyway and feel that they shouldn't give to this society. But the reason they are rich is because they have workers working in their factories that are paid very low wages in the first place. So they are actually getting rich on the backs of other people. And it's, it's only fair to give a little bit back in return. One isn't asking for a lot, one is asking for a little bit. And this is never the primary income. I think that is something that people always forget, that the, the companies that are operating in the tax havens, this is not the primary income. It's not the first source of income of the people utilizing it. It is the secondary, it's what they're using their savings for. And so when I look at tax havens, I think, I think uh, rich people getting richer and um, living on the backs of poor people in my country that are still unable to then survive as a result. Yes, they have a choice. They absolutely have a choice. See, I, I always compare the multinational with the homegrown company that's only working within the borders. That company has to pay the taxes, but the multinational doesn't. That's unfair. So your, your question by saying, is it, do they have a choice? Yes, of course they have a choice. Don't expand. Don't take on unethical practices. That's one way of saying it. But which of course the multi yeah, which multinationals will never buy in on. And I'm, I'm completely aware of that. But the multinational company is a company that is not only profitable within one country, it is profitable within multiple countries. That's why it's a multinational. So it is already profitable. There is no doubt, otherwise it wouldn't have products that people are utilizing. Now, instead of capitalizing on that and saying that, yes, we are making profit and we're good at what we're producing, suddenly they get greedy. And that's really what, that's really where the, the buck stops. They're getting greedy and they're utilizing legislation. Sometimes they're misusing legislation and they're actually committing crimes and they're trying to make more profits. Somewhere along the way, people put aside uh, humanity and started to look at greed and started to look at lining their own pockets and being able to afford more and more expensive things and buy more and more luxuries. But they forget about the people at the bottom who are working in the factory or who are picking roses in the rose farms. They don't get that upward mobility. They get stuck. So 
yeah, it, 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 they do have a choice. They can make an ethical choice. They can also make a legal choice. There are multinational corporations that actually don't abuse the law. I'm still looking for them. But I believe that they're out there. And it's really important that they be used as a gold standard, as it were, that they be shown as companies that are not doing bad things and that it's possible to make a profit. Well, there's, there's different ways to make a difference and it depends on your, your personal feelings about different things. But there are organizations like UK Uncut or USA Uncut that actually go and demonstrate outside shops and tell people not to buy goods from those shops until they pay their taxes. That, that has already begun to happen as well. But I think sometimes that not buying those products can have an incredible effect on those companies. And the fact that they felt they could even do that in the first place, I, I, I was shocked. You know, when they talk about tax avoidance and evasion in developing countries like and in continents like mine in Africa. You think, yeah, because you know, we're lax, we're really bad at making laws, we have poor enforcement. You know, there's excuses for it. But these are companies in developed countries that are doing it. That means that, and I've heard tax um, investigators even in developed countries say that you cannot catch the tax evader sometimes unless you get a tip off. Now, if that's how bad the information is, then really we have a problem. But there is one thing I think that could provide a very good key. We have freedom of information now all over the world. Everybody's pushing for it as a right. Most constitutions in the world have freedom of information. This very squarely falls under freedom of information. Allowing tax authorities to access this information is critical if they're going to be able to do it. And supporting any discussions on that will become really, really incredibly useful. I've seen people demonstrating outside different places all over the world. And very often the, the end uh, problem or the core problem is usually tax. Because people don't really get up for anything except when you know when their money gets affected or when they cannot eat or survive and tax does tend to do that but now it's no longer hating the tax collector which has been you know the tradition in in most countries in the world now it's it's to, it's actually to to dislike or to hate the person who is not paying their fair share because when they don't pay their fair share government looks for tax in another place and inevitably especially in my continent they're looking for it in VAT so VAT is paid by the end user of the product which is you and me and everybody else and that means poor people are paying a larger percentage of their tax of their sorry of their salaries in tax which is really bad but what can they do they can go and complain about it they can write letters to their members of parliament that is really important I cannot stress that enough because I've noticed that when you tell them what you don't want they actually do pay attention whether you're in a developed or developing country beginning to try and understand these issues and being able to get them into public debate is also very important It is a crime to break a law. But for some reason, tax evasion gets this really fluffy picture with multinationals talking about low profitability. But it is a crime. And on it, rests on it on the back of a lot of criminal activity like money laundering and drugs and you know slavery and prostitution. And all of these still exist. And they use the very same mechanism, I think, when you ask me about mechanisms, the one thing that really is coming home is that they're using the exact same mechanism and system. So even if they were legitimately transferring profits, the fact that illegitimacy can take place at the same time or illegality, uh, criminal fraud, that is unacceptable. We need to protect the weak in society and the weak in society are the poor people in Europe, and there are now plenty. You see them on the streets. There are homeless people everywhere. The poor people in the United States, there are also homeless people there. The poor people in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa. Because no matter where you go in the world now, people are poor. People don't have housing. 
people are losing their houses and have to go on to government subsidies. That is, that is the direction of society right now, and it has to be reversed. And this is actually, instead of cutbacks in social welfare spending, which is what is happening, here is the ready-made answer. Simply enforce your legislation.